Welcome to those of you just joining us. We're going to give it um, another couple of minutes here as people are coming in. Welcome to everyone who's um, joining us. We'll just give it one more minute here to let people all log on. Good morning or good afternoon to all of you, depending on where you are in the country. Um, thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Krista Morose. I am the co-director with the Minnesota Green Step Cities and Tribal Nations Program. And I also co-chair the Sustainable States Network. Um, and we are excited to co-sponsor today's session, as well as the entire Sustainable Municipalities, Innovative Practices, and Emerging Trends in the U.S. webinar series with the Hickson Center for Urban Ecology at Yale University and Sustainable CT. Today's webinar is the fourth in our five-part spring series, and our topic is Reinventing Green Spaces. We're going to hear from Yale professor Dr. Gerald Torres and two city examples. We will have time after each speaker to answer any questions you might have. You can type your questions using the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I'll ask the presenters to reply. To begin our session today, we'll hear from Dr. Gerald Torres. As a pioneer in the field of environmental law, Dr. Torres has spent his career examining the intrinsic connections between the environment, agricultural, and food systems, and social justice. His research into how race and ethnicity impact environmental policy has informed his teaching and practical experiences and has been influential in the emergence and evolution of the field of environmental justice. Dr. Torres. Uh, th thank you uh, for that introduction. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna break protocol and start with a commercial um, uh, ad ad advertisement to everyone. So those of you who are interested in these topics, that can join us at a, uh, uh, it'll be a webinar style conference during Earth Day week in which uh, tribal nations will be responding. Uh, it, it'll be a conference on tribal nations response to climate change. So uh, just a little uh, uh, commercial uh, there before I start. Um, I wanna thank you for, for having me uh, today. Um, and I, I'm gonna focus, uh, since I have seven minutes, um, uh, really quickly on on the importance of green space, both um, as a vital component of the process of, of addressing questions of, of environmental justice, but I then also want to turn back to the uh, somewhat deeper question, which is the importance of green space as a way of linking communities together and supporting the democratic infrastructure uh, that we uh, that we depend on, and let's see if I can do all that in um, in uh, the next five minutes or so. Uh, first of all, I, I, I want to uh, uh, suggest that 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 bringing green spaces to cities is is important for a number of reasons. First, uh, a friend of mine who recently passed away uh, made it his life's mission, and his organization continues to this day to re-green the Los Angeles River. 
to, to bring green space back to, to LA. And one of the things he noted, and one of the things that we all should note is the extent to which the communities we live in are um, both park poor sometimes or green space poor. Uh, and, and so why does that matter? Well, for parks, it, it matters because parks are the places that, uh, where communities are constructed. They're places that uh, allow people to get together. They are spaces that belong to everyone. Uh, and because they belong to everyone, uh, really do, in my view, underline and reinforce the, the, democratic, the democratic ideal and the, the self-governance ideal. So, so I'm here I'm just talking about, about parks, but parks, to the extent that you have the capacity to contribute and to build those out in, in public spaces, it's not just the health effects of having green space, there's a political effect of having green space and connecting people to uh, the actual land uh, they, they, they live in. So that's uh, the second point. The third point is that from an environmental justice perspective, green space is absolutely critical. And it's absolutely critical on it, uh, at least three dimensions. One, uh, to the extent that, that cities have more green cover, you improve the air quality. You improve the air quality largely related to particulate matter uh, in the air. And particulate matter is, of course, the, uh, the uh, air pollutant that's most commonly associated with uh, the uh, rise or the presence uh, prevalence of, of asthma in, in uh, inner city uh, neighborhoods. So that, that just the committing to make a city greener is actually making a commitment to the general public health of, of that community, that's one. Second, and the, the literature on this I've just looked at, um, is, is that green spaces actually contribute to the, the cooling capacity of cities. Uh, and so when you start to look at, at uh, communities that are green rich, as opposed to communities that are green poor, you discover changes in, um, in uh, heat profiles. And heat profiles, uh, which will become uh, in increasingly uh, important, uh, have a direct impact on the quality of life in those neighborhoods. Finally, and this is the other research that's just come out. And it's not the stuff that I, I normally look at, but I've been reading a lot in, in the area recently is the, uh, the link between green spaces and mental health. That, that in fact, one of the things you can do to improve the mental health in the community is to have public green spaces available, one, but just have more green space in general. Um, so putting trees uh, on streets, uh, doing plantings on streets, making sure the boulevards are actually planted, just things as simple uh, as that can add both add to the the well-being, the mental well-being, the psychological well-being, uh, as well as the the physical well-being of the community, and can contribute to the capacity of that community to make its contribution to the wider uh, network of uh, of uh, communities in addressing the challenges of uh, of, uh, of climate change. So. What I wanted to try to do is to situate today's discussion in a, in a much broader context and to underline uh, the importance uh, for sustainable cities right, of green space uh, in contributing to the creation of sustainable communities. And by sustainable communities, I, I don't mean just the physical communities, I mean the political uh, sustainability of the communities the, the self-governing capacity of the communities. They're tied together. It's not often clear exactly how they're tied together, but they are tied together. And you can feel, I think you can feel a commitment when you're making the uh, environmental addition, the environmental contribution, that you're making a commitment to the, the life of that community. And that's the, that's the critical link. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Torres. I think that was a great introduction to today's webinar. Um, I've got a couple questions from the Q 
Q&A, I think your commercial did really well at the beginning because there's interest in the uh, tribal conference that you mentioned and whether or not there's a uh, link you can share with folks about how to find out more information about that. Um, I, I, I don't have a link at my fingertips, um, but uh, if you uh, email me at my Yale address, which is gerald.torres uh, at yale.edu, uh, I can uh, put you in contact with the, uh, the, the two students who are running the logistics and, and they, they can uh, tell you how to uh, sign up. We, we don't even have the sign up page up yet because it, we're, it's in Earth Day week, but don't worry, it'll, it'll, it'll be there. Um, and I'd love for everyone who uh, wants to come to, to please, uh, please contact me and, and uh, I'll see if I can't get the, the information uh, even on the, maybe even on the YSE uh, uh, website page. So it'll be easily uh, uh, accessible to, to people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions out there? There is a Q&A button um, for those of you in the audience at the bottom of your screen. You can add additional questions um, as, throughout our presentations today. There's one question in here, and I'm not sure if it's specific to you or maybe for all of our presenters today, um, but the the commenter says, in advance of the presentations, um, should long-term architectural considerations be taken into account when thinking about green spaces? You have any thoughts about that? Um, well, the, the short answer is yes. <laughs> uh, um, uh, the uh, you know the uh, when you think about about uh, architect architecture and and its role, we think about the built environment, right? What you're thinking about, it seems to me, are, are at least two things. One is um, the uh, the way in which it represents both private and public investments, uh, and uh, the uh, the time scale of the things that are built there. So, so the the, the built environment uh, will have an immediate impact, but it will have a long term impact as well. There's a um, there's a geographer who I love. His name is Ifu Tuan, uh, who 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 wrote a book called uh, it's got a terrible title called Topophilia, which is basically about why we love the landscapes we love. But then he also wrote um, another book called Space and Place, and it, it is about uh, and Landscapes of Fear. That's a third book, uh, and they're all about architecture. They they not all about, but they have significant uh, uh, um, uh, portions that directly address the impact of the built environment on the question of uh, making a place um, the kind of place you would love and want to be in. All right, so I think, uh, I, don't know, I don't know if that answers the question, but. I think so. I think some of our uh, presenters coming up here might be able to, to speak to that as well. That was my thought. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Torres. Um, our next speakers are joining us from Meriden, Connecticut. Howard Weisberg is the city's director of public works. Prior to that, he was the associate city engineer for seven years. His work experience includes serving as the deputy director of public works in New Haven, Connecticut, and as an engineer and administrator for both Maryland State Highway Administration and Anne Arundel County, Maryland Department of Public Works. He was recently appointed to the board of directors for the Northeast chapter of the American Public Works Association. And joining him is Paul Dixon, with, who is the Director of Planning, Development, and Enforcement for the City of Meriden. Paul grew up in Shoreline, Connecticut, and worked for the Town of Groton Planning Department before transitioning to Meriden five years ago. He has a landscape architecture background and previously served in Meriden as the Associate Planner and Zoning Enforcement Officer and Assistant Planning Director. Howard and Paul, we're really glad to have you join us today. Take it away. Thank you. I'm going to be sharing my screen. Let's hope this is successful. Uh, can everybody now see my screen? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. I'm Howard Weisberg. I'm the Director of Public Works. I'm going to be discussing the history of the Merit and Green. Paul is going to discuss the uh, uh, fun functional aspects of it. Um, so this is a nice overview of the Meriden Green. Um, 
remember this because we're going to get into the uh, sordid history of it for uh, a couple of minutes. Um, a little fast fact about Meriden. Uh, Meriden's a city of 60,000. It's halfway between New York City and Boston. It's about two hours by car or train to, uh, well, two hours by car to Boston, two hours by car or train to New York City. Um, it is also halfway between New Haven and Hartford, a half hour between each, uh, well serviced by highway, well serviced by transit. Um, Meriden has a um, brook called Harbor Brook that essentially runs the length of Meriden from Northeast to Southwest, starts at Falcon Field, ends at Hanover Pond. It's about three and a half miles. In the middle of this is downtown. This is where our Meriden Green is located. It's right in the heart of um, historic Meriden. Meriden is an old industrial town, as you will see from the following photos. Um, actually, a little bit more about Meriden. Uh, Harbor Brook's water, uh, watershed is 12 square miles. That's almost half of Meriden's total land area. Um, there are a very large number of properties in the 100-year floodplain, uh, 225 acres, and 300 properties and structures are um, in that floodplain. Um, and as I said, Harbor Brook runs right through the center of town, a number of old factories, um, a number of historic sites as well. Uh, this is Meriden in 1934. Uh, this is the area of the green outlined in uh, red. This is the Meriden green. You can see it is an industrial area. You can also see some semblance of uh, streams running through it. Uh, a lot of it is covered up, but there are some areas where it is daylighted. Uh, this was International Silver, a number of other factories. Um, Meriden is called the Silver City because of its presence of uh, Britannia and International Silver um, in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, and you can see uh, the channel right here. In 1972, uh, they decided to do away with the channel entirely, daylighting it, and cover it entirely to put up uh, what is called the Meriden Mall, or was called the Meriden Mall. It was later changed to Meriden Hub because they built something called Meriden Square Mall about two miles away. Um, just to the right of this is um, uh, Mills Memorial Housing Complex. It was built in 1950, and that also covered up uh, part of the stream. Uh, this has both of these sites have since been demolished. Um, this is a close-up of what they did with the Meriden Mall slash hub. Uh, you can see the conduit, uh, the old Harbor Brook. This is Harbor Brook reduced to a, I think, 18 foot wide, six foot high conduit that runs under this property. And there is a mall right next to it. Um, obviously a bad idea. This is a flood taken in 2008. Um, unfortunate, and you can see this is a significant flood impacts downtown. This is actually a little bit south of downtown. Uh, what's interesting is this isn't the first time this has happened. Uh, there have been 11 major flooding events in Meriden since, 18, since the late 1800s, uh, many of which have caused, caused significant financial harm. Uh, the photo on the right is quite interesting because they were redoing downtown, putting in new sidewalks and infrastructure, and they had a massive flood. Um, and you can see the Redevelopment Agency Public Infrastructure Improvement sign essentially being flooded. Um, the $14 million of damage led to the creation of a flood control implementation agency. Uh, what was the work required? Three miles of channel improvements, 10 bridge replacements, two flood storage basins, one of which is the Meriden Green, and the creation of a linear trail system, uh, essentially along the length of the project, uh, reducing the number of floodplain impacted properties and reducing street flooding. And this is a timeline from essentially the mid 1990s to the grand opening of the green is about 20 years. So there's an awful lot of work in here. There's a, a flood control master plan permit with the Connecticut Department of Environmental uh, Protection uh, that we use to govern our entire project. Um, here is a, the floodplain before and after. The light blue is the old floodplain. The new blue, the dark blue, is essentially the Meriden Green area right here. Um, this is a larger list, a larger uh, graphic of the floodplain. It also has our um, linear trail and on-road bike network that is a major component of this project. Um, 
deciding what we, to do with the merit in green wasn't necessarily cut and dry. They had looked at essentially the Los Angeles system of channeling. They had looked at just walls to retain the flooding. Ultimately, they decided to go with a more natural um, environment and ended up with this cross section um, to allow for park activities and other sorts of activities along the green. With that, I will turn it over to Paul Dixon. Paul, you're gonna use your own screen? Um, actually, what I will do, if you don't mind, I'll just have you advance. That's fine, go ahead. Okay, so once the city made the decision to move on beyond from a you know traditional flood proofing only just a channel and a bowl, it opened up a new opportunity to downtown that the planning department worked with the engineering department and most importantly with city council uh, on developing a TOD plan for downtown. So the TOD plan was developed in 2013 and the Meriden Green or the park site, the former mall site was a key focal point to it. Uh, next please. So the project goals for the Meriden Green, primarily flood mitigation, erosion control, hard design, aquatic habitat, but the big overall umbrella of economic development was a major component uh, to the green itself. So along with enhancing downtown and reducing floods, we had to have no downstream impacts. So that really guided our design, that really guided the city's design and how it went forward with the entirety of the flood plain. So how did we fund it? So the funding, as far as it was from multiple different sources. So the cleanup of the green itself was a $2.9 million combined grant. Um, there was choice neighborhoods fundings when it came to different studies, especially with the Mills Memorial uh, apartments, additional flood control bonding. Really it's get it from everywhere you can and continue to get it from everywhere you can as long as you develop the plans. Uh, from there, a major component of Meriden as part of downtown was to look at the Meriden Mills Memorial Apartments and parks. So as it existed previously, as you can see the mall site in the center and then the Meriden Mills Memorial Par uh, Apartments, the green that's shown on your site is really the only park that was located within that downtown area. Um, it's kind of the only highlighted is the Mills Apartments, but really all the housing around there is multifamily housing the housing on the other side of downtown are two and three families. This is a dense urban area. Uh, next slide. So the Meriden Mills Memorial Apartments, as you can see in this kind of uh, you know, oblique shot, is or uh, constructed in the 50s and 60s. They were demolished in 2018. It had 140 apartments and five buildings. You can see it was primarily surrounded just by a sea of asphalt. And actually you can see the highlighted area of the channel actually going through the site where they decided to build the um, you know, low income housing um, property on top of that channel and in the floodplain. Uh, again, it was available property. It was probably easy at the time. Again, this did cause issues with flooding, flooding of those apartments themselves, the mall site, uh, which again was not a great idea. Uh, next slide. So this is the next slide is the outcome after uh, the green was uh, constructed and after a public-private uh, partnership, including funding from DECD, including Brownfield cleanup funding, really this was a, a, a private-public partnership and um, with a lot of support from the city council in creating the Meriden uh, Commons. So the Meriden Commons apartments are kind of highlighted in yellow, and now you can see kind of the proportion of housing in the area to park has drastically changed. Uh, next, please. So the Meriden Commons apartments are 154 units. These units actually have community amenities, um, far more respectful of their residents, washer dryers, community space. Uh, th there's a lot more to them. It also has commercial space uh, that is on the adjacent uh, arterial roadway, and they are 80% restricted, um, you know, low income and a couple other specific uh, restrictions and then 20% market. Uh, next, please. So the park itself, the design really was to make sure it still had connection through the space, connection from one side of the park to the other and to create distinct spaces throughout the park. There are large open spaces, uh, you know, areas that are actually made with drivable turf that can be used for events. 
And there's also the large outdoor amphitheater that creates another distinct space. And uh, these spaces have actually been heavily used. Uh, you notice there's an area marked future open space. Uh, this is actually where the um, Mills Memorial Parks were demolished. Uh, the site will be remediated and then another extension of the green placed on that site. Next, please. Uh, and to, if I may interject yeah, go ahead. briefly, uh, if you notice on either side of the uh, cross section on the bottom, you see two large um, rectangles. Those are future building sites. Um, I know that was one of the questions earlier and it has now been a uh, point of contention uh, in the park that um, I don't know how much we want to get into. Yep. so yeah, to add into uh, as a, um, just if you're going to do something of this scale as a city, and just to remind you of those, we have inherited these plants. Uh, this is a 30 year uh, horizon project from start to finish uh, how it goes. So this is something that will, it's a career project. Uh, so if you're going to build something on a park, we recommend actually denote and kind of marking it out where it's going to be and not turning it into a 100% used park before you're going to do it. Because going from built structure to park, people will love it. Going back to another built structure, you will have a lot of pushback. So we recommend if you're going to do that, at least marking the space off. And yeah, you know, that, that's just a little aside. So the main focus, the main purpose, of course, of the Meriden Green is flood control. As you can see with a photo simulation, it is designed to be completely inundated, inundated um, to relieve um, flood waters from the surrounding commercial area. Uh, next, please. Another main aspect of the Meriden Green was actually brownfield cleanup. Uh, this was another source of the funding. As Howard noted that this was the International Silver Company. This has been multiple manufacturing on this site and then it was capped with a mole. So it's a site that needed you know, some significant remediation. Uh, the same goes with um, the Mills Memorial apartment. They needed some remediation on that site too uh, for us to turn it into expansion of the park. Next, please. And another aspect is the habitat restoration is to create, uh, we're actually working on actually enlarging pollinator pathways through the city, utilizing the park. We've actually seen increases in uh, wildlife and actually fish who are using the corridor more so than we ever saw previously. So beyond that is actually the community aspect of the park. So this is part of having all the connections, having everywhere built, really creating distinct spaces for to be occupied for, again, farmers markets, to be occupied for events, to be occupied for concerts. Uh, we've had actually some successful concerts at the amphitheater. This is actually making the park about the community, programming for it. As it looks a little barren right now, you know, in about 30 years, there'll be some beautiful tree cover on some of the areas of the park, but it's gonna take a while. Next. And again, it's about connecting the neighborhood. Uh, this is a loved and ridiculed bridge all at once that went across the park. It has become an architectural feature. Some people love it, some people don't, but it really is just making sure that you're accessible in the park. It adds a landmark and there's a network throughout the site to get you to wherever you need to get while still feeling you're in a park. Uh, it doesn't feel like you're on a city street anymore once you walk into the green, but it is safe and you can walk down and see into it pretty easily. Next, please. And again, as I noted, the pedestrian connections, um, everything in the park is designed to be flood and it's engineered, but it's really set to experience the space. Um, and really to get people down to the brook and connect them back with the brook, connect the brook back to the city. And from there, as I noted, there have been multiple programmed events. You can see on the bottom right, I know it's weird in the time of COVID to see it still, but you know, multiple people massing, uh, watching concerts and events, having pop-ups behind them, uh, and it has been pretty successful uh, downtown. And this is kind of, as we talked about before, the future development opportunities. Now this was presented as part of uh, the whole project itself. It is a way that the city was able to access additional DECD funding uh, is that this is an economic development driver for the city. Yes, the park connects everything, but to get the park built, you have to you know, purposely build it and actually program it. As you can see where it does show the buildings you know, proposed on the green. And from there, this is our, our latest project. Uh, so this is the expansion of the green. And I'm gonna let Howard continue a little on this, but this is primarily a project that Public Works has kind of spearheaded along with a uh, internal development committee 
that we're working on design. Uh, this really is a sensory garden. It's a, it's a lot um, put together and an amenity that we're looking to add downtown for our residents in the city. And Howard, if you would like to take it away a little on this one. I'll sure, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, one of the challenges with the green, it's 14 acres. It's won countless awards, but but there isn't a lot of everyday space on there. Um, if you're looking to take your kids somewhere, um, because it's a flood control project first, there can't be a playground because of the fencing needs. Um, one of the things that we uh, looked at doing was looking at a disadvantaged group. And we realized that there was a, a lack of um, amenities for people with sensory issues or uh, different, different abilities. Um, so we started studying and working with our Board of Education Special Services Department to look at how to engage that segment of the population. And we came up with a program that has uh, a whole bunch of sensory areas that are independent of each other. So things can be experienced um, one at a time without overwhelming. Uh, so it's a, it's a nice little area that we think we can create out of a, out of a four acre plot. Um, it's, uh, it's one of those things that we think is going to be a nice additional amenity. Um, and we're hoping to get that built within the next two to three years, uh, funding dependent. That's pretty much, uh, what we have. Yeah, but I'll add, and it was a private answer that came in, but the park itself is 14 acres and this is an additional four acres. So we're looking to have hopefully 18 acres of park downtown. Thank you so much, Meriden, uh, Howard, and Paul for, for sharing this. Um, I I know I want to come visit. Um, I'm a little far away in Minnesota, but maybe someday I'll make it out there. Uh, it looks really great. We do have a couple questions coming in. Um, for those of you in the audience, if you want to use the Q&A box at the bottom to ask any questions for our panelists, um, please do so. And we'll have some time at the very end, too. So... Um, I got a couple questions kind of on who manages the gardens, uh, how does the maintenance, um, how, do you, how do you keep it clean and pretty? Uh, our parks department does an amazing job on it. Uh, they're, they're phenomenal, but one of the reason, one of the challenges with the next phase of the green is we actually want to get a friends of the green committee together to essentially be stewards of the park. Uh, we do maintenance on it, but um, yeah, once it becomes more of an everyday activity, we really need to have community involvement and participation in it. Yeah, great. Um, and one kind of maybe similar to this, but um, so is, is, I guess the question is, is lawn care and surface water runoff um, considered as a part of the park project overall and, and the maintenance? Yes, uh, it's fully irrigated. There is a an unbelievably extensive uh, irrigation system in the park. So that's how it, it, it keeps its, its lush green appearance. Um, but surface water runoff is obviously one of the big um, things that we, we have to maintain. Uh, there's, you know, it, it's really just a water, water and mow operation. Uh, there aren't you know, very few chemicals in there other than um, when we have to do invasive species, invasive spraying. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much the goal there. Yeah, and I'd add to that, you know, the maintenance along the brook, um, it's really kept um, a naturalized plantings. Nothing in there is um, ornate. Uh, it's going to be where it's, you know, it's moleened, it's cleaned, it's done, you know, during times of the season when uh, you know, all native species would be dormant. And we just kind of maintain it that way and keep it naturalized as much as possible. Were ecologists consulted um, as a part of the planning and design? Yeah, Malone and McBroom uh, engineers, and I, I should um, give a shout out to Bob Bass, uh, the former director of Public Works, and Malone and McBroom, who were really responsible for making this happen. Um, but Malone and McBroom uh, had phenomenal uh, staff um, of ecologists and water quality experts and, you know, uh, landscape architects working on this and our next stage um, to develop something that was uh, sustainable. Well, thank you so much. I think we're going to move on to our next um, presentation here. There are a couple more uh, questions in the chat box if either of you would like to respond to those or, or we might have time at the very end as well. Our final speaker today joins us from Jersey City, New Jersey, Melissa Koz Kozakowicz. You're gonna have to say that again, Melissa. 
uh, is the Chief Innovation Officer and Assistant Business Administrator for the City of Jersey City, New Jersey. In her role, she manages a wide variety of municipal teams, including but not limited to grants and fundraising, data and innovation, sustainability, diversity and inclusion, and engineering and architecture. Jersey City is one of 12 cities nationwide selected in 2015 to participate in Bloomberg Philanthropy's Innovation Team Program. Innovation teams function as in-house innovation consultants, moving from one mayoral priority to the next. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Melissa. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Everybody um, has already contributed. Um, so many notes I've taken already. So thanks for, for having us and, and for including our project. Um, I'm here to today to talk about Skyway Park. Um, I think some of you um, have maybe heard of this project already. I'm gonna share my screen and just kind of dive right in. Um, there's not too many slides here. So, um, okay, there we go. Um, so, so Skyway Park um, is an inactive landfill in Jersey City. Um, you can see the, the picture on the left um, where it says 1973. Um, the park has a pretty sordid history, to be honest. Um, it's 87 acres in total. Um, Jersey City currently owns 32.5 of those acres. Um, it was added to the Superfund site, um, so the Superfund National Priorities List in 1983. Um, and remains um, on the list, although we are in the process of delisting. Um, through, um, okay, I should get back to that. Um, so um, 1968 uh, began operations as a commercial landfill um, and there were allegations of illegal dumping up until 1984. It was filled with chemical and industrial waste during the time period of 1970 to 1985, it would spontaneously combust due to buried waste and decomposition of landfill materials. Certainly you can appreciate um, the impact on residents, um, commuters and visitors alike, um, just looking at it. Um, the remediation process began in 1983 um, by adding it to the Superfund um, NPL list. Uh, by 1985, uh, we had um, largely gotten the fires quelled, um, but literally the site was spontaneously combusting for over a decade. Um, you can see in the bottom left, um, there's a, a resident um, with a sign. I would say that part of the reason that this site has been um, has been able to, to grow and thrive in the way that it has is largely because of resident activism. So if there are any activists on the call, keep doing what you're doing. Um, uh, okay. Um, we removed 4,700 drums of chemical waste um, in 1985, 60 lab pack drums, 4,559 cubic yards of contaminated soil, 1, uh, sorry, 136 pressurized gas cylinders and lots of other assorted contaminated debris. Why did we buy this? <laughs> um, we bought this site um, largely as mentioned um, because of um, encouragement by residents to just clean it up and make it better. Um, so uh, we com uh, completed uh, the purchase in 2010. Um, uh, and um, finished the remediation in 2012. That's a remedial cap. Uh, I won't get too technical um, in what that means, but uh, I think uh, if anybody has specific questions about that, I'm happy to answer it, answer them. One of the things I will say, if you're capping a property, be aware of the depth of the cap. Um, as um, this cap, it, it ranges from six to 18 inches. Um, which doesn't really allow for much to happen on this site without additional, um, you know, additional soil being added on top of it, um, which is what we're doing. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to come back to where we are now. Okay, so this year, um, we really noticed in Jersey City a real lack of um, Oak Parks and Open Space in Jersey City, um, as everybody's, Jersey City is a very densely packed area and everybody's been home and looking for places to go outside. Um, and we just thought this park needs some attention. Um, and also we really wanted to honor um, some of the um, 
the loss and the grief um, and the trauma that Jersey City and many cities across the country and the, and the world um, underwent in 2020. And so um, Skyway, the vision for Skyway Park um, is to turn it into um, a passive park uh, community grove memorial. Uh, the concept was designed um, to stand along other great public memorials, um, including the uh, Peter Walker's National September 11th Memorial and Lewis Kahn's For Freedom Park. Um, you can sort of see some of the features kind of going through it, but I also have some some breakout slides that I can show you on, when I kind of get through the talk track. Um, the site will feature um, an accessible path connecting the Hackensack waterfront walkway to uh, various groves situated throughout the design. We're hoping for somewhere around 513 trees to be added, um, which represents the amount of Jersey City residents who um, were not able to have uh, any kind of uh, funeral uh, when they passed away at the beginning of COVID. Um, the site will also feature river access for engagement um, on the southwest quadrant of the waterfront walk. Bicycle and vehicle parking will be provided with several um, secure single occupancy bathroom facilities. Um, pedestrian bridge utilizing design vernacular from the overarching Pulaski Skyway will connect across the SIP ditch, which is actually a CSO outfall. Um, to um, to the formal memorial installation at the majority of the grove. Um, there are smaller groves throughout the site that will activate three quarters of the quadrants delineated by the Pulaski Skyway and the SIP ditch. Uh, the Northwest quadrant will be left largely open as a gathering space for the community. A uh, terminal pollinator garden will frame views to the Hackensack River. Seating opportunities will be installed throughout the site to provide the moments of reflection as well as furnishing other gathering spots. The site will be planted with stately trees that provide significant canopy and long lifespan to maximize ecological benefits. Um, and the site will acknowledge the heritage of the property and the incorporated green infrastructure via didactic signage elements. So I'll stop share and get you to, sorry. Ah, we weren't supposed to have any technical difficulties. Leave it to me. Okay. So this um, this slideshow kind of walks you through. Sorry. Kind of walks you through the experience. Um, this design assumes that people are coming by a vehicle, but there is also um, some protected bike lane access to this site. Um, so this is sort of the the grand vision. Um, it's a, it's from the parking lot. To the Melissa, parking lot. I don't think we're seeing your slides yet. Oh really? Darn it. Okay. Well, you didn't. Um, let's see. Didn't need to see the parking there we lot. Go. Anyway. You see this one, right? Yep. Okay. So this is the view from the parking lot as you're entering into the memorial space. Um, the a, a kind of an overview shot of, of what the, the, the parking looks like as it engages with the park. This is the transition and restroom area. This um, bridge, little bridge pathway sort of mimics this, the, um, the skyway, larger skyway bridge that is sort of looming over the, over the park in general. Another shot of the bridge heading towards the memorial. Kind of stops you, stops you in your tracks when you look at this memorial and just remember all, all the trauma that you know that, that we've experienced here and like I said in other cities across the country and, and all over the world. But um, looking at this slide, it, it really um, instills a sense of pride, honestly, to to be able to take such a such a traumatic and and, um, and horrific experience that we had and and um, put it in in such a, a beautiful place on such um, kind of abused um, and resuscitated land. So that gave me some pause there for a moment. Um, you can see the um, you can still see it um, from from multiple different angles, but. This building you see in the in the left is a, a piece of the property that we share. Um, it's a public-private partnership here, and that piece doesn't is doesn't inc 
include the 37 acres that I mentioned earlier. It's um, sort of a, a warehouse space, um, but we're hoping that we can, that this wouldn't be the angle that people are typically looking at it from. Um, and the, um, the trees are hopefully going to really take up a lot of the space as well. Um, As I mentioned earlier, the, the, the Skyway sort of takes over um, a lot of the space. So we attempted to do to allow the design to incorporate the Skyway since that's certainly not going to be moved anytime soon. The butterfly garden is one of my favorite parts. Um, the grove was separated into a couple of different sections. This is one right, right on the waterfront. And I think that's, oops, sorry. I think that's all I have um, on design elements. Um, I don't know if there's any questions, but uh, this park is hopefully gonna be finished um, at the end of uh, 2021 or beginning of 2022. We do have some um, additional fill to add on top of the cap that currently exists, which is pretty exciting. Um, they have some technology that sort of lightens the load so that we can plant the trees there without disrupting the cap. Um, so if there's any other questions, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, for those of you with questions, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I think we have a couple coming in here. Okay, so here's a good question. Um, how, well, I'm curious, what kinds of trees are being planted? Is it, is it one species, multiple species? How, how is that being decided? It's multiple species, but to the point about not being able to disrupt the cap, we are adding about six feet of fill on top of the cap. So we're looking at trees that can that the roots don't that more spread as opposed to go straight down. Um, so we don't have an exact determination of which trees are going to be in which part. Um, I think I mentioned also earlier that the cap varies in size from six to 18 inches. So there are places where we do have a, another foot of buffer, which isn't necessarily that much for a tree root spread, but in addition to the fill that we're putting on top of it, um, we're hoping that this is going to be um, manageable. Thank you. That answers another question that someone had too. Um, and then could you speak to about the funding sources for this project? Um, it sounds, was there, you know, what, this sounds like the city was already thinking about a park here and just because of the pandemic that kind of morphed into how that the park formed, but was there any other specific funding that um, led you to this design? Well, the state allocates um, some money each year um, to open space projects. Um, typically it's a matter of priorities as to which park you use. This park actually had, I think, something like $800,000 left over, which anybody who designs parks knows that that's not nearly enough for this. Um, but um, so we, we had a little money in the kitty and we already own the property and the rest of the price tag, something around um, 12 million will be a combination of municipal bond and uh, fundraising efforts. How are you imagining that visitors would engage with the grove of trees? I think that, um, I, I, as you can sort of see a little bit from the, from the, let me see if I can get it back up real quick. As you can sort of see, there are these pathways that go in, sort of in between the trees. I don't know if you can see my mouse or not, but the pathway kind of goes all along there. Um, and so we're just imagining it to be a quiet place of reflection um, where people can walk through and just experience the, the peace and quiet that the trees provide um, in, a, in a contemplative um, and passive way. Um, obviously, we also do have a, a municipal forester overseeing this project, um, and we do anticipate needing to, the maintenance piece um, needing to be a large engagement part as well with the trees. Great, um, one person asked when, I think you mentioned this, but when is completion of the park expected? Well, if you ask the mayor, he'll tell you 2021. 
but I think closer to 2022, adding the fill itself is is, is a, a big piece. Um, as you, you know, I mean, it's 33 acres, so a, you know, it's a lot of fill. Um, so I, I think we need at least a full year. And are there any other parks in the area or is this gonna be like a new, brand new green space? Well, it, it exists already as a green space, but it's just basically just grass. Um, there's not even a, a formalized pathway, although um, anybody who, who lives in an area um, of limited parks, you know that residents just create their create their own pathways. Um, so there there is sort of an informal pathway that already exists. Um, it's already it already it is available for for residents to use, but it's not really desirable, right? So um, that's sort of the difference here. I, I don't know if I answered the question. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, Melissa. I think we will bring back um, all of our panelists and see if we have any additional questions for anyone um, to share. And there are a couple in here that I'd like to open up to anyone. And they're both speaking about uh, the relationship with green spaces and our fossil fuel use or greenhouse gas reduction uh, you know, opportunities that exist there. Um, there's also a specific question about is solar being incorporated in these green spaces? I don't think that anyone mentioned those particularly, but was that any part of the consideration as, um, as your spaces were being developed or, uh, or, uh, should it be, or is, um, how does that fit into the conversation? As far as Skyway Park goes, we we haven't um, talked about putting solar on this site, um, but it's a great point, great question. Yep, and I can answer as far as for Meriden, solar is something that we actually, we are exploring as a city too, but in, in a project like this, the difficulty, especially when you do a, a space that floods is what can you put there? Um, you're very limited. So on these sites, you know, while it's something that we like to incorporate, um, the city itself has a large uh, property on our landfill that we have a solar farm is something that we're working towards, but the, the challenges of the site itself are going to dictate, especially when you have these old brownfield sites and yes, it'll work on certain caps, but how that works with your actual programmatic theme, how it works with the problem you have to solve does get difficult sometimes. We, we are actually looking at um, a wind turbine in our new section, more as a kinetic sculpture element, but also showing the the benefits of, uh, of that as a renewable energy. They have some vertical turbines that we're looking mm -hmm. at that we think can, can be incorporated nicely into our, uh, into our area. Yeah, and uh, there'll be a lot more demonstration pieces, I would actually say, because that can actually power some lights. That could, we're going to have rain gardens. We're going to have all that. Again, it's, the, it's these demonstration pieces that show it works on a smaller scale that we you know, want to actually incorporate in more places. All right, I'm trying to sift through all these questions coming in for you all. Um, okay, so both of you talked about pollinators um, and, and having space available to them as well through flowering plants. Um, why was that important? Uh, from our perspective, it's really the green space creation um, and trying to create a green corridor through town. Um, you know, uh, we have a fairly large Audubon uh, presence here, so um, they have asked for pollinator pathways and those elements to, inc to be incorporated. Um, we have a number of locations through town where we're actually looking at that. So, so a lot of that has been um, as a result of that. It's also a the plantings of pollinator pathways are an easy way to engage people into the project. Um, you know, you can give them each little uh, trowels and give them a section. And you know, once conditions allow, we plan on engaging uh, the community and planting a lot of these elements. 
Um, similarly, um, we uh, were working with our uh, friends of Skyway Park and some other interested stakeholders uh, who have been very invested in pollinator gardens across the city. This isn't actually the first one that we've installed with some of our uh, community stakeholders. Um, so it, it's sort of at this point, um, pollinator gardens are one of the things that we are always adding um, to parks as we're developing new green spaces. And from a maintenance side, in a way, they're a win-win. Um, you have an area, especially if you were going to turn it to grass, it's difficult to get to. Um, we have a property that we're working on another uh, park where there's an area that's not that highly trafficked. It has to be mowed all the time by turning it to a pollinator pathway, making it actually something to work with the schools to work so they can use it for education. And also you just change the maintenance reg regimen to you know two times a year. Um, to actually maintain it rather than constantly mowing and creating more runoff. And they look so pretty. <laughs> Both of you talked about transportation um, as options and, and how people are getting to and from these parks. Um, is there anything you could add to that? You know, why, how, when do you start having those conversations? I mean, I, I think both of you ended up with land that you knew had this potential to turn into a green space. And so you couldn't really like build it where the transportation system already made sense necessarily. Um, so how do you kind of work backwards and think about how people are getting to and from these parks um, in an equitable way? Oh, I think, oh. Go ahead, Melissa. I think for us, um, the transportation is, was really one of the beyond the um, contamination. Transportation was one of the biggest um, how to solve problems, uh, one of the biggest problems that we had to solve. Um, and that's because the, the site is a little bit out of the way. Um, I think I mentioned at the beginning that there's um, a highway route 440 um, that sort of cuts right in front of the entrance point. Um, and that really, that really doesn't make for a desirable park where it's sort of incorporated into the rest of the city. So it was really important for us to figure out how we could how we could make sure that people could get there from a couple of different perspectives. I think in general, um, as we're thinking about um, building any kind of space, be it park space or plaza space, even um, some of our um, new housing projects, we're really trying to make sure that these sites have access to multimodal transportation um, parking uh, because we, we really do um, look forward to a future where all of the city is accessible by means other than vehicle. Yeah, and I added Merritt and we, we lucked out, I should say, by design. It's uh, the train station is right downtown. The major bus hub is actually pretty much right across the street from the park. It's ultimately, in a way, part of the park uh, where the DOT uh, just built a new train station. Um, so what we've been doing in Meriden is connecting um, the parks with the linear trail system, which connects all the parks through the city that are, you know, Brookside Park above it, through the green, and then connects to South Meriden. Um, we're also looking at ways that we can connect, um, you know, the linear trail through bike routes that pull people into the trail system so they can, you know, enjoy the space as a whole. Because this is in our downtown core. This is in our highly populated area of the city. So it's where it needs to be. Yeah, so I, I think it's also interesting too that we picked two case studies that were uh, contaminated sites uh, in a way, or you know somehow just not not engaged with the community in a way that uh, people would want to uh, you know participate or play or work in. Um, and so, how how did the community, um, you know, when thinking about this contamination? how did the community have a voice in how the decisions were, how these decisions were made or how these plans are being, were or are being developed? Well, for our part um, in Jersey City, um, we have a very engaged um, group of stakeholders who are always interested um, in working with us. 
on these kinds of projects. Um, Jersey City has a history of contamination. Um, we have a, we had have um, mostly gone now, but we had a, a chromium problem in Jersey City, um, you know, based on some old industry that was here. Um, and there were a lot of parts of the city that we had to do a lot of investment um, in uh, cleanup in order to to create these beautiful sites. And, and I would say that at this point, um, while it's, it's, it is mostly cleaned up, um, these are sites that are, that are not that easy um, to, to kind of get at. So um, it, it does make sense to, to do the cap and then, and then put a park on it. I would say that anybody who's doing that in the future, try to have the park plan as a part of the remediation process, right? Don't remediate and then plan the park put the park plan into the remediation process. So then you don't have to add six feet of fill on top of it when you want to make a park. <laughs> from our, from Meriden's perspective, um, the green was built with a really large committee of uh, elected officials, representatives, et cetera. Um, our Meriden green phase two, we're currently in the formation. We're at 60% plans. We presented to the council um, we are now in the process of forming the um, steering committee to take it from 60% to, to completion, um, to refine the features, um, to work on fundraising, to build public support. So, so that's, that's we, we didn't want to get them engaged before 60%, but now we're at 60% and we think this is really the time to get the community engaged and energized because it's a much shorter window and um, they can actually see results. Yeah, but I'd like to add, um, so for, for the phase two that we're talking about now, even before um, we were looking at the actual communities abroad, we did um, engage through the design process, the community affected the user group. Um, even as we were talking, you know, working with the Board of Education, working with other people who would be, you know, guided to have some more knowledge than us when it comes to the specific users of these parks. So that is pretty much from 10% from inception, from draft plan, you really need to understand what you're doing this for, uh, who is going to be using the space. And I think, you know, I think this brings us back to Dr. Torres is opening um, for us today around environmental justice and, and thinking about how these spaces are, are usable and, and open for everyone in our communities um, and provides those many benefits as a part of that. Dr. Torres, do you have anything to add as a last comment before we wrap up? Let me unmute. No, I think um, I was actually uh, quite uh, quite thrilled to, to watch both uh, the the discussions of both these programs because what they what they both done is is a they've accomplished in, in obviously clear environmental goals right but, but they they took land that was essentially um, out of the public space and created these these new public spaces and and the the reverberations from it I mean the the just the visual and environmental improvement is one thing right. But the reverberations from it socially, uh, it'd be nice to figure out a way to, to, to capture that and measure it over time. But um, I know I, I think both these projects are, are, are actually thrilling. So thank you for letting me par be part of this. Thank you and thank you to our two city um, examples and all of all of your panelists today and everyone online for joining us. Um, we have one last webinar next week in our series featuring the concept of eco districts. Um, so event information, past webinar recordings and reg registration links um, are uh, will be posted in the chat and we hope you can join us. So thank you again, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much.